like to welcome everyone to this uh, regional summit on rail and transit integration. My name is Todd Portoon. I am a commissioner, one of three county commissioners for Hamilton County, Ohio. I also have the good fortune of being the president of the board of directors of the Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana <coughs> Regional Council of Governments and am the chair of the Hamilton County Transportation Trans Improvement District. Uh, and so I, along with uh, uh, my co-convener, who will be up here momentarily, the mayor of the city of Cincinnati, John Cranley, uh, are hosting this summit on transportation issues. And we're delighted that everyone is here today. I'll tell you what a difference a week makes. You know, a, a week ago, uh, I was in Washington, uh, D.C., along with the other officers from OKI and our executive director, Mark Polosinski, where we had just been meeting with Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana's representatives and senators about transportation issues and transportation bill and funding and funding and funding. And did I mention funding that uh, we were talking about? But as we were leaving, again, this just a week ago, somewhat apocalyptically, the person at the gate was announcing as we were boarding the plane that anyone uh, who wants to get out of Washington, D.C., had better board that plane because this was the last flight out of Washington as, uh, as their latest version of White Death was approaching the, the capital city. So here we are today with spring-like weather and it's, uh, it's a delight to, uh, to have. Well, let me share a little bit about, um, just for a moment, and then I'd like to bring uh, the mayor of the city up uh, to uh, offer welcoming remarks on behalf of the city of Cincinnati. A little bit about what we're, we're doing here today. We've got a very full agenda uh, and we think a, a very interesting and exciting ag agenda with uh, some terrific remarks that are going to be given by uh, federal representatives from the Federal Department of Transportation uh, on behalf of the White House, uh, as well as the Federal Rail Administration uh, and DOT. Uh, we have representatives from the Ohio Department of Transportation who will be sharing uh, insight and information with us today on rail and transit integration. But the point is, and the focus of today is going to be on rail and transit integration. Um, while there certainly have been calls for discussions about all things transportation related over the past couple of weeks, we're not going to get into the deep dive today on expanded bus service or, or bus rapid transit, though they are important and, and there will be uh, nods to them. Uh, we're not going to get into the discussion of access service or expanded access service for people who are, uh, uh, suffer, as I do, some physical challenges in terms of accessibility of public transit though there will be nods to that. We're not going to get into bike or pedestrian corridors and those other matters in, uh, in any great detail, though they are important elements of our transportation infrastructure. The focus today is, is going to be largely on, primarily on rail and transit integration, uh, given the existing rail infrastructure that we have in the greater Cincinnati region, Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. And when the mayor and I announced that we were putting this summit together back in December, it was at a point in time when there was some question about whether the streetcar in Cincinnati would move forward, and if it did not, what would be done with the infrastructure that was already in place. And we also wanted to send a message, a very clear message, to federal officials, to state officials, to the region at large, that regardless of how that discussion uh, ultimately concluded relative to the streetcar that there was uh, not only an interest but a commitment in moving forward toward developing a regional transit system in the Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana region that will meet our needs uh, and that can be done and that there is a commitment towards to send that very strong and, and clear message. So the streetcar issue has been resolved. Um, all the more reason to discuss integration of how we can continue to develop a regional transit system 
uh, using existing infrastructure integrated into a multimodal transportation system that serves the needs of the region. So with that as a preface to, uh, to what we're going to be about today, um, let me offer one little ground rule as well or a housekeeping measure and then I'm going to invite Mayor Cranley forward. Uh, we will have distributed, if they haven't been already, um, index cards because as we go forward through the program today there will be questions that I'm sure you will have or issues that you may want uh, the panelists to touch upon that perhaps they may have not touched upon or, or they've piqued an interest in your mind that you'd like for the panelists to address. So please fill those out on the index cards. If you need more than, than one, uh, ask for it. I don't think we have a shortage of index cards by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, please do that. We'll be collecting those uh, throughout the day. Um, it is a long day. Uh, but an exciting day, so please, anyone, if you need to uh, take a break before the announced breaks, don't feel bashful about that. Get up, um, go to the rear of the room, get a beverage, um, use the, the facilities if you need to. Uh, it's not going to be uh, embarrassing or, or be awkward to any of the, the panelists or anything like that. So um, creature comfort first. That's going to be the rule of the day for, uh, for everyone. So with that, uh, it's my honor and privilege to uh, introduce uh, to you for opening remarks on behalf of the city of Cincinnati, a very good friend of mine uh, for many, many years, uh, the mayor of the great city of Cincinnati, Mayor John Cranley. Thank you, Todd. It's, it's great to be here uh, with you. And, I, and, I, and it is a, uh, just a fact that while Commissioner Portune has very generously um, agreed to share this uh, honor of co-hosting this uh, program, which I think is vital to the long-term interest of our region um, with me, the fact is that he really is the foremost leader on transportation issues in our region right now. And for no other reason, uh, because he's got <laughs> the chairmanship of OKI, the chairmanship of the Hamilton County Transportation Improvement District, and he is, of course, the longest serving Hamilton County Commissioner, which is, of course, the largest uh, government body in, in the whole uh, region that we're all concerned about and care about. <clears throat> so he has sort of the, the levers of power, but we also know Todd as someone who, for his entire career, has been very progressive on promoting multimodal uh, opportunities for our region, whether it was uh, serving on city council and, and being always an advocate for the bus rider, as well as uh, uh, the, the, the riders who, who do need additional help uh, with access and things of that nature to what he's done, which is, you know, they say, uh, you know, her, the, the whole quote about herding cats, you know, he has helped bring together Butler, Warren, Claremont County Northern Kentucky, Kenton Campbell and Boone, to really do something that I think can get done, which is bringing in a, a, a passenger rail opportunity that not only could connect Claremont County with downtown, but also ultimately downtown with the airport and with Northern Kentucky. And that's really Todd's vision. The rest of us get to help and hope to see it come to fruition. But none of this would be possible if he hadn't taken the drive and the effort uh, over many years to bring people together to use convening opportunities like OKI. And as a measure of his commitment to this, of putting the region ahead of his sort of turf, if you will, years ago he and I worked together um, to reformulate SORTA. And under state law, Hamilton County uh, creates and establishes the membership of SORTA. And we had a lot of discussions about that and the city had certain interests it was trying to uh, promote. But instead of just saying no way Jose, Todd worked to change forever and to create a more regional approach which included introducing for the first time ever Butler, Warren, Claremont counties into a governing body that was controlled by Hamilton County. So it's because uh, Commissioner Portune changed the structure of SORTA that we now have at least when it comes to our bus service um, three more counties and we're m that much more regional uh, because Todd was willing to give up in essence 
uh, some of, uh, of control because he felt that the regional discussion and the regional dialogue was more important than trying to fight over, over turf. So uh, he has been a leader and, a, and it is a great honor to be here uh, with him. I think I'll just make a few points and then and get on with the program. Um, I think that we have a unique opportunity and there are enough people in this room from different parties and different parts of our region that if we work hard enough, we can get something to happen um, with the plan that Todd and others have laid out. And I think it'd be a really exciting uh, opportunity of getting something done. And I think bigger picture, we, well, I shouldn't say, I guess maybe smaller picture from the city's perspective is that we are the only, as most people know, the only jurisdiction in the region that has a dedicated funding source to transit. And that's something that is important. Uh, but Cincinnati Enquirer recently uh, had an editorial about transit and they identified that Cincinnati compared to peer cities or peer regions is dedicating less money to public transportation of all forms than all of our competitors. And the fact is that um, in order for us to be the city and the region we want to be, we are going to have to figure out a way to bring more resources to bear um, in order to make this happen. Uh, because the <coughs> funding source that we have is essential to maintain current levels of bus service. In fact, we want to expand bus service, but we don't have additional resources to do so. And in fact, the same Enquirer study that showed that we were behind in funding per capita showed that our metro, in large part because we don't have as much funding as our, as our competitors, is more efficiently run than any of our uh, competitors. So we get more bang for the buck out of our bus service than any other of our competitors. And that is a great testament to Metro and to their leadership and to their operational efficiency. The fact of the matter is that if we want to expand transit opportunities, whether it's bus or rail, we've got to figure out how we're going to bring more resources to the table. And I also believe that this is not meant to be uh, an imposition. I believe that communities should be given the choice if they want to participate or not. And there are some communities, for whatever reason, that do not want to uh, expand public transportation, whether it be rail, bus, or whatever. I'm proud to be the mayor of a city that is extremely and unabashedly pro-transit. We are dedicated, we have unanimous belief among all the elected officials uh, in preserving and expanding bus service to the extent we can. We have uh, another majority, which I'm not part of, that wants to do the streetcar. <laughs> but the point is that we have, it's not a question of whether we're committed as a region to transit or not. It's just that how robust of that commitment it is. And I think long term, we need to find partnerships with jurisdictions who want transit and figure out working cooperatively the way Todd has convened us to find additional resources so we can build the city and the region that we all want. And candidly, if there are communities that don't want it, well then let's work with the communities that do want it. And, and there are pros and cons, and we as a city of Cincinnati have decided that, there, that the pros of dedicating tax dollars uh, to transportation outweigh the cons. And we are unabashedly proud of our commitment to public transportation. And we want to work with communities moving forward who also are going to opt in. And we don't want to scapegoat or, or criticize communities that, for whatever reason, don't want to opt in. But if they do want to opt in, we want to work with them to expand access of all types uh, to the communities around the region. And it's with that spirit of hoping to work with new partnerships and to work forward that we, the city, uh, are here to be part of this discussion and to help advance it forward under under Todd's great leadership. It's great to be here. Thanks.
Mayor, thank you very much. Those were great remarks, and uh, what a way to kick off uh, this summit on transit and uh, integration into a broader transportation system. I think you have uh, uh, certainly set the bar at a very high level in terms of, one, a commitment and a financial commitment as well to supporting transit. It's very easy to say you're pro-transit. Um, it's tougher to say that you're going to come to the table with the money to help make it happen. So I think that's, uh, that's part of the challenge. And the other thing that you have uh, really established here as we kick this off uh, is the issue of choice. And um, we have to be ever mindful of that because uh, if there is anyone who is not willing to be a part of the dialogue, um, it's a tough sell. It is a tough sell. And so part of our, our uh, process here today is to establish why it's a good thing to, to broaden the public education around the benefits of transit for our region and what we have going already where we are and what we're able to accomplish. Truly, the, the fact that we can get there if we want to, if we have the commitment as a region to get there, we can get there. The next part of our program, uh, this is a real uh, pleasure for me to introduce and to bring forward from the Federal Rail Administration, Richard Van Buskirk. Now, your program says Karen Hedlund, Deputy Administrator of the, uh, of the Federal Rail Administration. Yesterday, uh, during the day, we got word that uh, uh, Deputy Administrator Hedlund uh, was coming down with, uh, with an illness. Um, and there is some bug going around because I will tell you, I have it this morning. Um, I'm glad to be able to be here, but uh, if she has what I have, there's no way she could ride a plane and get here this morning. Um, no way at all. And she can't, and she has not been able to, uh, to be here, regrettably, because she very much wanted to be here in the Federal Rail Administration, very much wants to um, set forth that it is a partner with uh, this region with the 200 local jurisdictions in the eight counties and the three states that make up our metropolitan area. And as a testament to their commitment, uh, FRA scoured the landscape to make sure that someone was here to kick off and to present and to uh, represent uh, Deputy Administrator Hedlund uh, in a very, uh, very capable way and to deliver uh, as close as possible the message that she was going to deliver as we kick this off on behalf of the administration and that's Mr. Van Buskirk. Now I'm going to, as, as Richard, as you come forward, I want to say a couple of things about you. Um, uh, Mr. Van Buskirk is the, uh, the chief engineer for Regions 1 and 2 with the uh, Federal Rail Administration. He um, has tremendous experience in establishing rail systems. In fact, uh, he is not only a, a U.S. Navy veteran, but he was in charge of uh, establishing a new uh, a rail system in the nation of Iraq and spent a, a fair amount of time uh, over the past several years uh, in Iraq in heading up that effort. Now. Um, Richard is a, is a working man, as, as uh, his uh, attire can, can attest. He, he was going to be in the area doing, doing um, rail inspections today. And in fact, he still has to do rail inspections. Uh, and, and, but he took the time uh, to fill in and to pitch hit. Uh, and we're thrilled that he did, because um, in doing so, uh, Mr. Van Buskirk, we know that we have a great partner in the Federal Rail Administration. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Richard Van Buskirk from the FRA. That's quite the introduction for an old outside dog. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Fortune. The green is everybody. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I said in a meeting, nothing could be worse than watching someone read from a document. <laughs> I'm going to have to please request that you're patient with me. And uh, it's very important for me to process to you uh, uh, FRA's commitment to this event and how important it is. It's important. It's Im I think it's important. It's important for all of us. Nothing's more important than good transportation infrastructure. This is great stuff. Uh, let me. First of all, thank OKI for planning today's summit. 
planning as it happens is really the essence of today's meeting. A big part of this, uh, our mission at FRA is to enable the safe, reliable, and efficient movement of people and goods for a strong America, for now and in the future. A big part of this mission is working with states and regions to understand and ultimately address their transportation challenges. As federal funding partner, we look to reward strong state and regional planning efforts that based on market analysis reveal both the need and public benefits of investing in rail network <coughs> enhancements, both passenger and freight. So I want to talk especially about how strong state and regional planning efforts can both improve transportation options and enhance safety. Also, while we continue to make our case for predictable and reliable state federal rail funding that will move your good plans more quickly to construction sites. Our investments since 2009 are now at work improving 6,000 corridor miles of rail in this country, building or upgrading 40 stations and manufacturing hundreds of new passenger rail cars and locomotives. And because of our strong commitment to Buy America, which requires all of the projects we fund to be manufactured domestically, made by American workers, and built with American-made parts and supplies, the economic rip ripple effects go far and wide. So what we're seeing is that it's about more things than what we build or even the transportation options that we improve. It's about the connections we make, about people, communities, and jobs. It's about a new rail car manufacturer opening up in Illinois and hiring 300 people to make next generation rail cars and in process creating new potential business for a nationwide network of rail suppliers that includes more than 400 employees in the Midwest alone. It's about a 30 mile rail extension track in Maine that winds up creating new work for 53 companies in 23 states including Cleveland Track or 70 Northeast Corridor locomotives, the largest fleet of diesel electric locomotives produced in America since World War II, purchased through a railroad rehabilitation and improvement financing program loan. The locomotives were made by Siemens with parts from its plant in Norwood, Ohio, and a plant right here in Cincinnati that built the motor. All told, 69 suppliers in 60 cities and 23 states contributed to that order. In Indiana, our investments will replace a 110-year-old railroad bridge in Greene County, and eight infrastructure projects now underway in Indiana will reduce congestion and improve safety along Norfolk Southern and Amtrak-owned rail lines. In Kentucky, we have invested in improvements in five short-line railroad connectors between rural America and the global marketplace. And in Kent, Ohio's 20 DOT, 26 million investment in new transit center has catalyzed four times as much in economic development. Similar to what we have seen with our rail transit train station projects in Maine, Illinois, and in Colorado. My point is, why would we not continue to make these smart investments? Both in rail, and they increase our economic competitiveness, extend the ladders of opportunity, and prepare us for the challenges we face as a nation. In just the next few decades, our transportation network will need to move 100 million additional people and 4 billion more tons of freight. And to move it efficiently, safety, safely, reliable, we'll need a multimodal network that takes full advantage of rail's efficiencies. According to the Texas Transportation Institute, the annual cost of highway congestion cost our economy over $120 billion a year. Our airports as well are struggling to keep up with a modern demand. Nearly 20% of all flights delayed, with significant cutbacks being made in short haul flights in small and medium sized cities. <coughs> Meanwhile, with service levels targeted to the market, rail can be the most cost effective, least oil reliant, and most environment environmentally friendly mode. 
For freight, one double stacked intermodal unit train can carry the equivalent payload of 300 trucks, saving nearly 80,000 gallons of fuel over the cost of a cross-country trip, freeing up precious highway capacity and generating significant savings in highway maintenance costs. <laughs> and for passengers, two railroad tracks can carry as many people in an hour <coughs> as 16 lanes of freeway and do it more safely while allowing passengers a higher level of productivity and convenience. But this is as much about listening to the people. It's a common myth that America has too much of a car culture to embrace trains. And yet, over the past two decades, the percentage of households without a car has doubled. Studies by the US PIRG and Frontier Group, and I don't know who PIRG is, I'm on board right now. <laughs> <coughs> have documented that Americans over the past eight years have decreased vehicle mile travel by 9%. In fact, a study last year reported that a drop in total vehicle mileage may not recapture its 2007 peak before the year 2040. Meanwhile, Amtrak's ridership is growing faster than any other major travel mode, with more than 50% rider growth since 2000. <clears throat> with new ridership records set 10 out of the last 11 years, and travel habits are changing faster among young people. One report noted that in an eight-year period starting in 2001, young people reduced their auto vehicle miles traveled by 23% and increased their average passenger miles traveled by rail and bus 40%. So how do we make this multimodal transportation system a reality? It comes down to a few fundamental principles. One, a foundation of sound transportation planning that is more mode neutral and based on identified market and transportation needs. And two, predictable and reliable funding for all transportation modes in order to implement these well-developed plans. Now, regarding the first principle, OKI's work is a terrific example of the direction we need to be going. The Eastern Corridor Project is regional in scope, takes a systems approach, and recognizes evolving travel habits. There's only three more pages. <laughs> <laughs> OKI's comprehensive regional freight plan further reveals the necessity of systems approach and also the growing role of rail to meet tremendous increases in total freight volumes. But today I encourage you to apply similar comprehensive planning and analysis to determining the true potential of your passenger rail market. This is your backbone <coughs> or your starting point for investing in greater reliability, improving trip times, additional frequencies, those key factors that make inner city passenger rail more competitive with highway and air traffic. Consider the history of the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative, first formed by the Midwestern states in the 1990s. This was a shared vision for 110 mile an hour service that directly connects to the region's 40 largest city centers and offers travelers the convenience of seamless transfers to public transit. Long before any funding materialized, state DOTs worked together to make this vision happen, and the work paid off. When our high-speed and inner-city passenger rail program was announced, Midwest states were ready to compete sex successfully for grants, and they were able to begin construction within eight months of receiving funding. Today, trains are reaching 110 miles an hour on the Chicago-St. Louis and Chicago-Detroit routes. And in the next few years, the majority of both routes will operate at the sustained speed. In addition to offering superior on-time performance and a trip time nearly an hour faster than today's. Midwest train stations are being built and renovated. New American-made high-performance car and locomotives will enter service. An entirely new era for Midwestern Rail has arrived. And so, States take on a larger role in supporting inner city Amtrak service. This is all the more incentive to re-examine the broader regional vision and also look for ways to strengthen connections 
to other regions. This time is right to examine the market of potentially adding trains to the Chicago Indianapolis route and look at options like Chicago Cincinnati and Chicago Fort Wayne or Fort Wayne Toledo or bring bringing service to oil. The vision for high performance rail we have proposed to Congress will support these efforts. It is focused on rail safety, freight and passenger rail improvements, and strong state and regional planning. Our vision includes achieving a state of good repair for Amtrak systems. It includes making competitive grants to develop new passenger rail service and to substantially upgrade existing quarters. And it includes investing in seamless connections for freight and passenger mobile movements with other transportation modes. This includes addressing network choke points and increasing capacity, upgrades to intermodal freight corridors and connection points to help shift long haul inner city trucks to rail, upgrades for sh to short lines that provide those last mile connections allowing for hauling 286,000 pound cars and replacing old bridges. Finally, and driving safety enhancements like steel corridors when grade crossings are closed and overpasses and, uh, and underpasses are strategically constructed. On that last point, this is where I think your good planning can have a tremendous impact on improving safety. First of all, American Rail has never been safer. Since financial year 2004, train accidents and derailments have each declined 47%. Grade highway grade crossing accidents are down 35%. And according to our preliminary data, FY13 was even safer than FY12. <coughs> and FY12 was the safest year ever. The foundation of this dramatic drop to date has been our data-driven oversight and enforcement actions. But for now, we are making a push over our traditional oversight and enforcement framework to help drive continuous performance and improvements. 95% of all rail related facilities, fatalities, I'm sorry, are caused by either trespassing or highway rail grade crossing incidents. <coughs> the laser printer went back to a page of time. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in your planning, it is critical to look for ways to advance engineering improvements that improve safety for trains, for drivers, and for pedestrians. In North Carolina, a corridor development program now underway will add round trips and lower trip times. And part of the way it achieves those performance improvements is by sealing off the corridor through grade separation projects, which in this case will allow 50 crossings to close between Raleigh, Ra Raleigh and Charlotte. The Chicago St. Louis and Chicago Detroit projects I mentioned earlier, these are also great examples of how, in many respects, a higher performing railroad is also a safer railroad. In Illinois, a fundamental part of the state's, a fundamental part of the state's efforts to raise speeds throughout the majority of the Chicago St. Louis corridor to 110 miles an hour is the upgrading of 235 crossings and all public crossings will receive four quad gates with intrusion detection linked to the installation of power positive train control. So again, these are the types of rail advancements our vision for rail would support. And the sport in turn is growing in Congress for a key part of our vision, which is to create a new rail account within the Transportation Trust Fund. This is about rail achieving parity with other modes, such as our highways, that have benefit, benefited for decades from sustained federal funding. For the sake of Americans' economical competitiveness, we must look differently at how we plan for, fund, and build transportation. And we must fully support market-based state and regional planning and continue forming public-private partnerships that can move our nation forward, increase our economic competitiveness, extend ladders of opportunity, and strengthen rail safety. 
Thank you for being part of this new chapter in transportation history. Thank you very much. Richard, thank you very much. Let's give Richard Van Buskirk another round of applause, please. All right, so um, Richard, I think that the message uh, you've, you've uh, delivered here today is, uh, is one that we are very glad to receive, and that is uh, uh, both the partnership that uh, we're going to have with the Federal Rail Administration, but uh, I appreciate you laying out um, how supportive that the FRA is going to be uh, to us and with us in terms of, uh, of our efforts as we move forward and that when we look at existing infrastructure in the ground, um, especially uh, that which has been used for the movement of freight, how it can be successfully integrated into uh, a passenger transit system. Um, and fortunately for us, we have a tremendous amount of infrastructure uh, in the ground that presents opportunity. A lot of hard work to be done, but uh, presents opportunity. I'm going to walk a few things, walk through a few things here to uh, sort of lay the groundwork of where we are, uh, and then I'm going to bring forward Richard Dial, who's the senior transportation planner for HDR, um, where Richard is going to discuss relative to the Eastern Corridor Multimodal Land Use and Transportation Program, the results of some findings that we've received that really hit home the issue of, of need in our region with respect to regional public transit and rail transit uh, to move people uh, in addition to goods uh, and how broad and expansive uh, that need is and how supportive uh, the general public is uh, for us to move forward in meeting that need. And while the results that Richard will talk about arose as a consequence of our work on the Eastern Quarter Multimodal Program. They have application across the board to what we're looking to do as, uh, as a region. So we'll see if my technological um, inefficiencies handicap me here. Um, there we go. All right. So let me begin by in setting the stage to go back uh, actually almost uh, five years exactly to the sort of resolution that Mayor Cranley alluded to. Back then, the mayor was uh, a member of city council. I was president of the board of commissioners uh, for Hamilton County, and together uh, we felt that there was a great need to revisit the existing sort of resolution um, that governed bus transit in, uh, in uh, our region, uh, in Hamilton County at least. Uh, certainly didn't govern it in northern Kentucky or in the counties around us. But the Southwest Ohio Regional Transit Authority was anything but a regional transit authority. Uh, and more to the point, uh, its funding was limited and that was a source of some uh, discomfort for the city of Cincinnati that they were providing the only dedicated source of revenue for transit uh, in terms of a public entity. Uh, and yet the city did not have the ability to appoint uh, controlling members of the board. So they felt like their revenues were out of their control, out of their hands, and they had very little voice with respect to the issue of transit. The, the mayor, then councilman, and I got together and um, we put together a revised resolution for SORTA that was then unanimously adopted by the Board of County Commissioners, uh, adopted by the Cincinnati City Council, and adopted by the SORTA board. Uh, in December of 2008, and it established for the first time a truly regional transit authority that had voting membership uh, in, uh, in Ohio, voting membership from the four counties that make up Southwest Ohio. So Butler County, Warren County, and Claremont County uh, each had voting membership on the uh, SORTA board. Uh, its membership was expanded and the city actually has the ability to appoint a majority of the board members in deference to and in recognition of the city providing the only dedicated revenue source to transit. 
And that gets in part to the mayor's comments earlier today with respect to the challenge that is in front of us. And it is, we're looking to partner, we all want to partner with willing partners, uh, with people who want to come to the table voluntarily to be a part of a regional solution and part of a regional system. And this resolution allows for recomposition of the membership of SORTA depending upon the funding. So while the city may appoint a majority of the members today, depending upon who provides dedicated funding in the future, the membership can change and the appointment uh, quotients can change and will change based upon the resolution that uh, was put together. The resolution also calls for um, a regional mission. And I know you can't read everything that's, uh, that's up there. I wouldn't ask you to do that, but specifically, the resolution lays out nine key objectives for SORTA to advance in a leadership role relative to regional transit. And that includes expanding access service beyond its current limited approach that is inside the I-275 uh, expressway in Hamilton County. It includes reaching out to and engaging all of the other bus systems that operate in Southwest Ohio. Uh, for the purpose of discussing how partnerships can be developed to integrate those systems in more of a, uh, a single fashion or, or in an umbrella fashion where there is uh, integration of service, uh, consistency of approach, reliability of, uh, of service and, uh, uh, and fares and things of that nature. It calls upon SORTA to also help to lead the discussion in concert with others relative to developing a truly regional integrated multimodal transportation system and it discusses the possibility of creating a multi-state transit authority, not just an individual uh, Ohio uh, limited transit authority, but a multi-state transit authority. So that is the governing resolution that is in place for SORTA today. Uh, it is a very aggressive and progressive mission that SORTA has. Uh, and it helps to, uh, to set the stage in terms of those nine uh, mission elements, uh, a truly regional agenda for developing a multimodal integrated transportation system that serves the Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana region. There's other planning that uh, has been underway for quite a time. Uh, Mr. Van Buskirk referenced OKI repeatedly in his remarks in terms of planning. And I'm grateful to you, Richard, for doing that. OKI is, uh, I think, the preeminent planning body in, uh, in the region, especially around transportation issues. Among the things that are put together is the OKI 2040 plan. Now, OKI by law is what's called a Metropolitan Planning Organization, or an MPO. It is one of hundreds of regional councils of governments that exist in the nation and by federal law, every penny of federal money that is allocated for transportation projects that ultimately are meted out to local jurisdictions to be spent on transportation projects uh, must go through and be approved by and, and vetted by uh, the local regional council or MPO. So all the federal money that comes into this region for transportation uh, gets vetted through the OKI process and becomes uh, a part of, if it's going to be spent, projects that are contained within the long-term OKI 2040 plan. Uh, among the things that are included in the plan are, are projects that are, are very well known, uh, such as the Brent Spence Bridge, uh, clearly something that our region uh, is very well aware of that needs to be done with 7% of the nation's gross domestic product passing over that bridge on an annual basis. We know that the bridge is outdated uh, in terms of its ability to handle the automobile and truck traffic that, that goes over it. Um, I know ODOT officials are going to be in town tomorrow discussing uh, additional approaches to Brent Spence Bridge and funding. Funding is, of course, key to getting the bridge done every year, adding $100 million to the cost of that project. But the Brent Spence Bridge, it's not a rail transit program, but building the reconstructed Brent Spence Bridge and the new bridge as part of this $2.5 billion project for the region 
is going to have a great impact on congestion issues in our region as well as um, how we can successfully integrate roadway with, uh, with rail transit. Other programs and projects that are in the 2040 plan include the I-471 project in northern Kentucky and corridor study, views in terms of whether new lanes are going to be added or dedicated busway lanes or bus rapid transit to be introduced on I-471. Kentucky is also looking at uh, a corridor study called the Kentucky State Route 536 project. Um, that is a, a roadway that runs south of I-275 in Kenton County and will connect uh, Kenton County and areas that are open and ripe for development and new commerce in the region. Uh, a recent project and corridor study is the I-74 Bright project in partnership with Indiana and Southeast Indiana and in particular Dearborn County and uh, under the leadership of County Commissioner Kevin Lynch in Dearborn County. This too uh, is a roadway project that will open up new areas of development uh, and commerce uh, in the region serving both Southeast Indiana and Southwest Ohio and in particular in Ohio the areas of Harrison, Harrison Township and Whitewater Township and the Commerce Park and local regional airport that exist in Harrison, Cincy West Airport that's owned by Cincinnati State. Again, these are all elements of, uh, that are identified in the 2040 plan that are all part of a regional multimodal uh, transportation system. In terms of funding, uh, that being an important and key element, uh, OKI has been a leader in developing new legislation called RISES. Uh, in particular, Mark Polosinski, who's the executive director of OKI is, and uh, staff are the brainchild behind this legislation. Th these are regional infrastructure improvement zones. And in the era of public-private partnerships, RISs become critically important because this provides an incentive, a new economic incentive for businesses to invest in roadway improvements, transportation project improvements, that can also benefit that particular business entity. Today, uh, federal law does not allow a business the ability to get favorable tax treatment for an investment in a roadway project or transportation project that also produces a benefit to that business. Um, the only way you can get some favorable treatment is if in an altruistic way or a charitable way, donations are made for improvements that do not benefit the business. But uh, RIS is this new legislation that we have proposed uh, going back several years. It was introduced in the last Congress by then Congressman Jeff Davis and we're looking to get it reintroduced into the new Congress. That will produce uh, a real incentive for businesses to invest in transportation improvements. Uh, and so many of the projects in the 2040 plan that are local roadway projects, intersection improvements, curb cuts, access roads, things of that nature, um, RISs uh, will provide uh, a great incentive and a means to get those projects off the shelf and shovels in the ground and, and those projects underway. With respect to our regional rail system, let me introduce you to passenger fare charges. Now you probably, if you've ever flown a plane, you've already been introduced to PFCs because they're attached to your ticket. Um, Two bucks, three bucks uh, additional charge is about what they are uh, attached to a ticket and by federal law PFCs are to be used and limited in their use to capital improvements that are on airport grounds. But when we look at how do we extend a, an express line perhaps, an express new build route of passenger rail service from downtown to the airport, something that's been talked about for a long time something that is a part of a regional rail vision, something that is a part of the long-term planning for the airport, um, uh, as, uh, as acknowledged by Director Candace McGraw and in conversation with the airport board in terms of long-range planning. Of course, how do you fund that new build approach to, uh, to a new passenger line or freight line uh, or make the connections of a freight line to the expanded DHL terminal? Uh, at, uh, at CVG. Uh, well, one of the ways is an amendment to existing federal law that would allow the utilization of passenger fare charges 
to be spent on capital projects that directly tie into or benefit airport property as opposed to being spent directly on airport property. And so with 8 million emplanements annually at CVG, at $3 per emplanement, that's $24 million per year that could underwrite the debt service on a significant capital project in, in connecting the airport to the downtown Cincinnati area as part of a new build integration uh, with our existing freight rail infrastructure and uh, rail and right-of-way infrastructure that's in the ground. Of course, among the other projects uh, being actively discussed to expand our transportation system and that are contained in the long-range plan are bus rapid transit. And I want to congratulate uh, Metro and uh, Terry Garcia Cruz, the directors who's here uh, this morning and seated in the front row, but uh, an, an exploratory experiment in the Montgomery route to downtown Cincinnati is already underway with respect to bus rapid transit uh, as one of the options available to us in the greater Cincinnati area. Uh, and then of course there is the Cincinnati streetcar project uh, where the city has finally decided on what it intends to do and the direction that it intends to go and so that project is underway connecting from the intermodal transit center built downtown. Yes, we do have a transit center that was built downtown that occurred during the Fort Washington Way narrowing project in the 90s, uh, but it's sitting there waiting to receive new customers in the form of the streetcar, in the form of expanded bus service, and in the form of uh, passenger rail DMU service on existing rail uh, infrastructure and right of way. So all of these are set forth in great detail in the OKI Regional Transportation Plan, the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan, and I, in, I encourage you, uh, if you want more details on that, to go to OKI's website. Uh, just simply type in OKI in your search engine, uh, Regional Council of Governments, and it'll take you right to the website, and you can see uh, how all of this is set forth there. Um, which brings me then to the last uh, project that is uh, a part of uh, the discussion that I'm going to, to close in my remarks on and, and we'll be then inviting Richard Dial to come forward and to speak in detail about, and that is the Eastern Corridor Program. And I want to emphasize that because I think for a lot of people in the region who are very interested in passenger rail, there is a belief that the only passenger rail project underway, uh, being advanced, money spent on, that there's a commitment and a dedication to, is the streetcar project. Um, and or a belief that the streetcar project is, is uh, our region's approach to a regional rail project. The streetcar, as important as it is, um, is not, uh, it is a first step, but it is not the, uh, the true regional rail vision for uh, the area or the end to it. In fact, the Eastern Corridor Multimodal Program, which involves new roadway improvements and smart traffic system management and bike and pedestrian corridor improvements and things of that nature, is also advancing uh, for the first time locally a multi-jurisdictional, multi-county passenger rail connection on existing rail uh, track and right-of-way, the Oasis Rail Line, from downtown Cincinnati to Claremont County. And the current approach to it has it going to Milford in Claremont County. But as we have been working on uh, this project and program, there is uh, an interest in taking it to um, Eastgate as well and using a second rail line uh, that exists and rail infrastructure and right of way that uh, is, is um, in, in the running, let's say, and, and is uh, an option for us to pursue, and that is the Wasson line, which today runs from locally for passenger rail purposes from Xavier University in the west to uh, Eastgate in the, in the east. And so the kind of technology that would be used in this service is DMU or diesel movable unit technology. These are not the Eastern Seaboard, uh, Atlantic Corridor, uh, diesel heavy rail commuter trains that we're all familiar with and, and maybe have ridden at some time in, in our lifetimes or seen in movies and things of that nature, but DMUs are in fact uh, new technology, new build, they're sleek, 
They're quiet, they're low emission, they're attractive, they have all the bells and whistles that everybody wants in a, in a local passenger rail type of a service. And best of all, they allow us to use existing track and right of way for an additional beneficial purpose and that is passenger rail service at a fraction of the cost of new build. Um, with the Oasis line, the initial leg going from downtown to Fairfax, the capital cost is roughly a million dollars a mile for, uh, for that as compared to 25 to 35 million dollars a mile of expense in new build that involves acquiring new right of way and, and everything else connected to laying new track. So the benefit to us of a regional rail vision where we are able to successfully integrate existing track and right of way into a passenger rail system that forms the backbone for a multimodal regional transportation system is, among other things, the tremendous savings in cost that are realized and as a consequence that becomes a tremendous incentive to pursue that technology and, uh, and that type of service. Of course, you get with that as well all the benefits of transit-oriented development Mr. Van Buskirk talked about commerce and the bottom line is we're going to be hearing a lot about this today. Uh, the expansion of our freight infrastructure for the purpose of moving freight uh, as well as positioning our region as a hub center of commerce for freight to move through. Important because 70 percent plus of the destination points of goods in North America are within a one hour's drive from greater Cincinnati and therefore uh, we become a very attractive inland port of call as commerce hits the Gulf ports and the Atlantic seaboard ports after the Panama Canal expansion project is completed. So expanding our existing infrastructure for purposes of moving freight is important for commerce, but it's also important for the, from the perspective of transit-oriented development. All the spin-off new economic development that can occur as a consequence of providing a new service, opening up new areas for development, introducing new ways for commuters to, commuters to get to where they want to go and to get home again in the evening. All of that leads to transit-oriented development that generates revenues and creates jobs uh, that we need here in the greater Cincinnati area. And with respect to the Eastern Corridor, that project is moving forward where we are in fact in the process of detailed work on station area planning of the anticipated stations that will be developed from downtown to Fairfax initially on the Oasis rail line. Last slide that I'm going to present to you then is the regional transit uh, system or, uh, or grid of existing rail infrastructure and right-of-way that can be brought to good use uh, to an additional and beneficial use for the introduction of, of new passenger rail service as a backbone of an integrated transit system in greater Cincinnati. Uh, we've got existing track that runs from downtown to the east and downtown to the west, uh, as well as to the north and to the northeast, and track that also runs to the southwest. And so there's great opportunity here by looking at that existing infrastructure in a new and a different way and in, in a way where we can begin to integrate it in the areas where it makes sense, where we have willing partners, uh, where the, the people and the communities that are affected and are involved want to be a part of, of that program and of that new service. There is an existing infrastructure that lends itself uh, to great opportunity to us as a region to develop a new passenger transit system fully integrated with the other technologies and other systems that, uh, that are in place. That's really the broader vision and that's the opportunity that is at hand and much of today is going to be talking about what we're doing on that, uh, where we, we need to go to make that happen and uh, both the opportunities as well as the, the risks and the challenges that exist uh, in making that happen and I hope at the end of the day we'll all have a much, much better sense uh, in a much clearer picture of what can truly be accomplished here in Greater Cincinnati. So with that, I want to invite forward Richard Dial. Um, Richard's going to talk for about 15 minutes and then we're going to have a planned break uh, in, our, in our program this morning. 
So uh, we're only running about 13 minutes behind schedule, so that's, uh, that's not bad since we started late. So I'd like to welcome forward the uh, Senior uh, Transportation Planner for HDR, uh, Richard Dial. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. While Brad is setting up my presentation, I just want to express that growing up here in the Cincinnati region, this building was uh, a shadow of what it is today. And so uh, being able to come back and to be here in a, a very vital building is, is just an absolute thrill. Uh, Richard Van Busker provided us with an excellent overview, not only of the federal system and the FRA's role in that, but also laid out the fact that we can't provide just a single mode. We have to look at multimodal solutions to address the travel demand here in the Cincinnati region going forward. And that includes not only maintaining and improving our roadways, but also looking at alternatives such as active transportation, pedestrian and bicycle improvements, and also supplementing our existing transit system by looking at new technologies such as rail to provide a high quality, high volume opportunity for people to make trips and leave their cars behind. As part of the Eastern Corridor project, we have been very actively involved in soliciting public feedback at various stages in our planning process. And that planning process is continuing as Commissioner Portune laid out. We're beginning the discussion of station area planning for two of the stations that would be in segments one and two of the Oasis rail line, which would be the initial segment of a regional rail network. And so as we've gone to these various public meetings, we've had the opportunity to inform and engage the public. And I want to share with you that we've brought some of the presentation boards from those meetings, and they are out in the lobby here as well as in the lobby outside the area where we're going to be enjoying lunch later. Typically, though, at a public meeting, you only get the opportunity to reach a very small segment of the public. They don't have the opportunity to come out, certainly when we're holding the meetings. And so we did something different this time, and I really believe that it's innovative, and that's what I'm going to be speaking about. We held a virtual public meeting on the same day that we held the first public meeting, we rolled out online on easterncorridor.org all of the presentation boards that we were going to be showing at the public meetings. We had all of the documents that were available for public review and comment that had been produced to date. And we also used a tool called MetroQuest, and that's what I'm going to be uh, laying out for you this morning. And MetroQuest provides people with an opportunity to weigh in just as if they were at the public meeting and to present some very interesting regional results that I am going to share with you now. So the, the objectives of the MetroLink or MetroQuest, pardon me, MetroQuest survey were to solicit from people to refine the service schedule that we had laid out in the planning documents and to get from them their feedback. We had proposed a basic service, which would primarily be a, a morning and evening peak period commute service between the RTC and Milford, as well as opportunities to add to that service in the form of an evening add-on, a weekend service, and a service that could provide an option to carry people back and forth for special events at the various arenas and stadiums down by the banks and on the riverfront for all of the festivals that take place there. So not only to solicit from them information on the service schedule, but also to ask them from a regional perspective, where do you live, where do you work, where do you shop, what sort of improvement projects would you like to see, and how can we better serve you as we advance the planning for the OASIS rail study? The MetroQuest survey consisted of five pages, and this is really an innovative tool that I hope to see used not only uh, as we move forward on OASIS, but also on other studies where the public's opinion is solicited. The introductory page provided people with an overview, if they were not able to attend the public meetings, on what we were doing and where the OASIS project fell within the larger Eastern Corridor program of projects, which is overseen by ODOT as well as the project partners. 
In the second slide, we asked people, when you make a travel trip, what are those priorities? What factors are most important for you in considering what mode you choose to use to get where you're going? And those included such considerations as feeling safe, neighborhood vitality, access to a neighborhood, pedestrian walkways, predictable travel times, congestion, air quality, schedule flexibility, travel alternatives, and bicycle facilities. And the intent here is really to say what are the most important factors because they weigh in to the type of transportation network we as a region provide for the public. So in terms of the priorities, and we got a very robust uh, response rate, which I will share with you a little bit later, the number one priority was that people wanted alternatives. They wanted options for themselves to be able to make trips. And so what that speaks to is kind of what Richard Van Busker was saying, that the amount of vehicle miles traveled in the United States has actually peaked. In my own household, I have a 17-year-old, and when I was 16, I was right here getting my Ohio driver's license on my birthday. My son is 17 and has absolutely no intention of owning a car in the foreseeable future and rides public transit everywhere, which of course as a transportation planner warms my heart. <laughs> He's listened. <laughs> and we live on a transit line, which is great. We're a block from a trolley station. But you can see that travel alternatives was just a huge option, followed very closely by predictable travel times. And as we've seen over the past couple of weeks, what with the weather, predictable travel times are something that are very often outside our control. But not necessarily when you consider rail transit, because it is more immune to some of the frailties of the weather and uh, difficulties on our roadways. As we looked at the average rank of importance, uh, travel alternatives also came up with congestion being another big issue that people pointed out. So when you talk about predictability of travel and congestion, the roadway network is something that we can provide as many lanes as we want, but they will ultimately get congested. The uh, big corollary in transportation planning is there is no one single solution to providing for people's travel needs, as well as the idea that we really do not want to take paradise and put up a, a bunch of paved roads in order to get there. Next up, and, and this was something that I'm absolutely thrilled about, was the idea that we showed people the Oasis line and we showed people where the proposed station locations are. And then we asked them to, if they chose to anonymously, to provide information on where they lived, where they worked, school trips that they might be making, daycare obligations that they had, where they went for personal and recreational purposes, and lastly, where they liked to shop. And here's what we got back. We used GIS to map this out. You can see the people's destinations. And what's really thrilling about this is not that we got information just from people that live along the Oasis rail line but that this was truly a regional input. People from within the OKI region were providing us information, which I think speaks very highly to the desire for a regional rail network. So you can see that there are certainly some concentrations of where people live. Next up, when we talked about where people work, and you can see that uh, they're diffuse around the region, but also that there are real, very large pockets of employment in the Milford area, in Newtown, uh, just north of the Fairfax Red Bank Station, and of course in downtown Cincinnati. Next up, when we talked about school, you can see that uh, there are schools all over, obviously. A lot of uh, college activity, uh, certainly in the, the UC and Xavier areas. For daycare, one of the things that this was pointed out is people either have daycare located close to their home or close to where they work because they want to be able to to get to their children if there's uh, an injury or they have to take them home. It's also convenient to, to having your daycare close to your workplace. Personal and recreation, obviously there are so many recreational opportunities within the region that people go a lot of places, but as I mentioned, people also go down to downtown for all of the festivals and, and different events that are offered throughout the year, as well as for the many opportunities at the stadiums and the arena. Lastly, for shopping, there are some serious regional uh, 
shopping centers that seem to attract uh, a really large uh, bulk of the, the shopping trips within the region. And then we asked people to provide us with their input on suggested improvements. And how often do you get a chance to say, hey, I'd like to see a new bus stop. And that's information that we'll be providing to SORTA, as well as new bicycle connections, roadway improvements, pedestrian enhancements, which could be sidewalks or crosswalks or signage, uh, streetscape improvements to beautify their neighborhoods, maybe uh, roundabouts or uh, complete streets projects, and lastly, neighborhood enhancements. And again, we got feedback on all of those. Clearly, from a regional perspective, we have a wonderful transit network. As uh, Commissioner Portune indicated, it's one of the most efficient in the country in terms of being able to actively use the resources they have to provide a, a good quality transit service for the public. But there's always room for improvement and lots of people would like to see additional bus stops. In terms of bicycle connections, the Eastern Corridor is looking to provide uh, opportunities to connect existing and planned bicycle facilities wherever possible within the rail right of way, uh, recognizing of course the importance to maintain sufficient capacity to provide for the Oasis Rail Service as well as in segments one and two to uh, reserve right of way so that as other uh, corridors were incorporated into the regional rail network that we wouldn't create a choke point uh, arbitrarily and that we would have the ability to move trains at a highly significant volume going <coughs> forward in the future. In terms of suggested roadway improvements that, uh, as I said, we want to enhance and improve the highway network and clearly there are lots of desired improvements. Uh, suggested pedestrian enhancements all over, but uh, quite a number within the Eastern Corridor and the Oasis uh, Corridor in terms of streetscape improvements. And, and again, this is fantastic information. And from a regional perspective, this is a, a new tool that offers decision makers a chance to find out what the public is looking for and then to prioritize, prioritize those projects against the resources that might be available. Suggested neighborhood enhancements, and then we turned to, as I said, we wanted to refine the schedule. We had provided people in the Conceptual Alternative Solutions Report with these services that were laid out in very discrete chunks. But we asked people what they would like to see in terms of frequency of service and, and how important that would be as a determinant in someone choosing the OASIS rail transit system as a travel mode. And they said that they wanted lots and lots of service. And that's, that's what we heard very clearly. The preferred start time was 8 a.m., but we had people before 6 a.m., some people suggesting the service should run 24-7, but lots of people reflecting the traditional work day, the, the 8 to 5 or 9 to 5 work day. In terms of the ending time, we had proposed uh, some ending times for the, the basic service and for the evening service. And we heard people say that they would like to be able to access the service late into the evening in case they were working, if they were going out for an evening's uh, a dinner or a recreational or cultural event, that they wanted plenty of opportunities to be able to get back. Late night service, midnight was the, the time people want to travel. And that's really gratifying that, that there's a lot of interest in people being able to take a service other than driving by automobile to get uh, between the eastern communities, uh, Cincinnati neighborhoods, and the downtown area. And that late service was considered very influential for the bulk of respondents. Weekend service was also seen as very important. Certainly, I now live in Southern California, and the Metrolink system, which was originally designed as a commuter service now carries a significant bulk of its service and certainly in San Diego, the San Diego trolley is extraordinarily busy on the weekends. People really will leave their cars at home and take another mode to get there if you provide a service that offers them a viable option to do so. <coughs> special events, special events can be huge and we all know that parking for Riverfront and for Paul Brown, Riverfront, Pardon me, can you tell how long it's been since I've been to a Reds game? The Great American Ballpark, Paul Brown and the US Arena. Parking can be very constrained and so people are looking for other options to be able to get down to special events. And wouldn't that be great to offer them the opportunity to do so? Because 
we could then use that parking for people that were either traveling from farther distances or for other purposes, and the more the merrier. In terms of fares, fares are very influential, and fares have not yet really been determined. Obviously, we would want to work with SORTA. It would be part of a larger uh, network-wide uh, re-examination of the SORTA system and how we could integrate the rail service into that. But fares are important. One measure that has been used in other areas and that we would consider here would be a base charge for access to the line as well as a mileage charge with the idea of trying to keep rail service competitive with the price of driving using AAA's costs of driving as a measure. Free parking, free parking particularly for people that are coming from a long distance. Uh, we know that there are parking considerations in Cincinnati and people like the opportunity to leave their car behind and when they do so, leaving it there for, for free is an important consideration. The ability to transfer quickly, people found that to be less important provided that there was an opportunity to make that first and last mile and we're continuing to look at options for that as I mentioned. We'd be working very closely with SORTA to identify uh, feeder services if necessary, as well as to provide really good pedestrian and bicycle access so people could make a car-free trip. As I said, feeder service was deemed less influential, and I, I think that is a reflection on the nature of the community. Certainly in uh, the Columbia Tusculum area, it, there is an opportunity to provide a station with really excellent uh, walk-up, bike-up, and existing transit service connections. Technology applications. One thing that can really increase the amount of people riding on a transit service today is just the ability to, on their smartphones, be able to look at it and see when is the next bus going to come by so that they can plan for their day's activities and know that transit is there to serve them when they want to go. And so the opportunity to look at uh, technology applications like a smartphone app so that people could know when the next train would be arriving at their station as well as providing information at the stations themselves is seen as very important. And easy to get to. The stations need to be very convenient and certainly the station locations that we've selected uh, for preliminary consideration are uh, very easy to get to uh, with, with one exception and we're continuing to work on that. So. Frequency of service and easy to get to are really the two big considerations for the public in terms of their willingness to use transit, rail transit, as a travel mode. And the two least influential factors, although it is important to recognize that all of the factors were important, but these of the ten were the least important, were transfers and feeder shuttles. Lastly, and I'll, I'll wrap this up, we asked people uh, as we begin the station area planning process, we wanted to get some regional input on what were the most important design priorities. We recognize that the capital costs are significant. We want to look at stations that not only reflect the character of the neighborhoods in which they're located, but also have a regional branding and a regional feel. And if there are opportunities to save costs for the future, uh, based on people's priorities, we want to be able to do so. And so we looked at electronic messaging boards, bike storage and access, sheltered platforms, of course, so that people are out of the weather. Supportive services that might be located at the station. Uh, we're all tied to our phones, and if there's the ability to have Wi-Fi at the station or on board the, the vehicles, that would be important. Improved streetscapes, on-site security, and lastly, on-site shopping and dining, and the results of those were Sheltered platforms were clearly the number one priority, followed by electronic messaging boards, which, as I said, if people are able to know when the next train is coming, it really is helpful for them in making a trip choice where they're going to be able to take rail transit. On-site security was the number three. And then going forward, the least being on-site shopping and dining, which is great because so many of the neighborhoods in which the stations would be located already have thriving businesses that would be located in such a proximity that I think that this would be of mutual benefit not only for the riding public but also to enhance uh, neighborhood vitality, economic vitality. I'm going to skip this one and then lastly we asked people to weigh in on participant demographics. We offered them the opportunity to stay involved. We listed all of the project partners and we had a number of descriptions as to where people fell in the continuum of their enthusiasm for transit. 
And the number one was bring it. For the Cincinnati region to stay vital, you really want to attract the 26 to 40 year olds, those people that are our future. They are tech savvy. They are willing to explore other options other than driving. Certainly, we want to be able to provide a robust transportation network and a variety of opportunities for them to be able to travel. And those are the companies they're going to work for, and those are the companies that are going to want to locate in the Cincinnati region, so long as we provide them with a system that will support those employees. Their current travel mode for work and school is drive, and they drive to events, but that's because other than transit, they don't have more options. And you can see that they were looking for service all day and late into the evening. In terms of the age groups, you can see that again, the bulk of the, uh, the, bulk of the people were 26 to 40, but also we got significant uh, responses from across the age range. In terms of ethnicity, you can see the layout here uh, and the total respondents. In terms of their personalities, I told you we laid out a <coughs> variety of different options, including uh, no thanks. <laughs> and this is a, a list of the personality descriptions. And of course, the, the primary means of people getting around currently is they drive almost everywhere. For events, again, they, they drive. Uh, I am en enthused to report that Cincinnati has a very high um, participation in transit as a region. And here were the refined survey results. Because it was online, we got results from people in Tennessee. We got results from people in Denmark, for goodness sake. Uh, and it's like, thank you very much for your opinion. But what we did was we worked with OKI, and we normalized uh, to look at just the OKI zip codes in the OKI region. 94.4% of our respondents were from Ohio with 5.3 from Kentucky and 0.03 from Indiana. What's up, Indiana? 45% uh, of those people who visited the site actually completed the survey and provided us with some information. And again, I think this is a very important tool going forward to be able to expand the reach. We essentially got 10 times the responses uh, from the public than we got from attendance at the public meetings. And Typically at public meetings, you get people that fall on one side of the divide. They're either very much for a project or very much against the project. And this provides an opportunity for people of all uh, stripes in terms of their enthusiasm to weigh in and provide input. Uh, a little factoid that I think you might find interesting, we looked at the number one hour of when people provided us with information. It's 10 p.m. from 10 to 11 at night. Once the kids were asleep, once the day was done and they had a few minutes, they went on easterncorridor.org and they provided us with that input. And so this is the basic layout. Um, we got some written feedback and, and a lot of people were concerned about quality of life in the neighborhoods and I'm a big believer that this can enhance the neighborhoods. Um, as Commissioner Portune laid out, the vehicle that's been selected is a, a very quiet vehicle really quiet, you can stand next to it when it's operating and have a cell phone conversation. It's low floor, it offers great access uh, for uh, people of all uh, ages to get on and off the vehicle, very clean, uh, good technology, very cost effective. And of course, people are concerned about the costs always. So, um, lots of different things. All in all, uh, a fantastic tool. I think it's, it's going to be uh, carried forward as we go into additional planning. When we get done with the station area workshops, we're going to be providing the results to people uh, via that and also transitioning so that people understand that it's not the OASIS rail corridor, that it's your OASIS rail corridor. And we're looking for regional input as that effort is advanced uh, for consideration by uh, the decision makers. Thank you very much.